Five, four, three. <coughs> Good evening. Hi, I'm Jen Bonet with the Creative Coast Executive Director, and we're coming to you live from the Creative Coast new offices at 2 East Bryan Street, Suite 100A. You need to come check us out. We've got a great new, uh, brand new Class A office space for open collaboration and working together. But tonight is Entrepreneur's Night, and I'm glad that we have some folks in the audience tonight, even though it is a rainy night here in Savannah, Georgia, so not a lot of people come out in the rain, but here we are. Uh, tonight, I am interviewing Rad Radford Harrell, founder of Talent Soup, about his entrepreneurial journey. So, Rad, why don't you introduce yourself, tell a little bit about your background. I'm Radford Harrell. I've uh, been in Savannah about nine years now from... Atlanta and in lots of other parts and love the city like to contribute where I can um, three kids we homeschool live on the island life is great and this is not your first entrepreneurial journey you've 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 had a long and winding road you want to yeah, tell it, a little bit about some of the sure. companies before uh, it started in fifth grade <laughs> with a student project to generate some money we turned ourselves into a sandwich shop Awesome. Yep. And then, uh, you know, the standard, I don't know, shoveling snow and mowing lawns and organizing neighborhood teams of workers and all that stuff. Um, my first real startup was uh, an intellectual property collection and protection product for surgeons. I was in the medical device space back in the 90s hmm. and um, raised some money, had a... Excellent. had a had a decent little round and failed. Just fought really hard for 2000 or through 2003 from 99 to 2003. Oh, that was a hard time. And we were late to the party and late to leave and you know liquidated all the Aeron chairs and all that. So yeah, yeah. that was a hard time. It was. That yeah, was, it was. Those were rough but it years. was. It was a good. That was my MBA, so yeah. to speak. Yeah, I yep. remember. Remember it well. The rise and the fall. Yep. Um, so you you said you've been in Savannah about nine years. Yeah, I think that's I think that's right. I and you've got a good math. you've got a good story about how you got here. How'd you get you know, how'd you get big, to Savannah? Big Creative Coast fan. Oh. Um, Creative Coast was our kind of segue into Savannah. We were in Atlanta. My wife and I were in Atlanta. Um, I was introduced to Creative Coast through the Tag GRA Business Competition oh, right. for Talent Soup. And we had uh, started with 88 companies. We made it to the top three. We made it to the finals. And w along the way, one of the competing CEOs, who I, his name escapes me, was a Savannian and said, well, you should check out Savannah. There's a lot of great stuff happening. And so he introduced me to Bryn Grant and Creative Coast. And we came down for a couple of long weekends. And it was a no-brainer Yeah. after that. Yep. Excellent. Yep. Excellent. Excellent. Good to hear. Creative Coast success story. Big fan. Yeah. So tell us about Talent Soup, what it does, and, and, and how you got started, how you ca came across the idea and decided to pursue sure. that. Sure. Ta uh, Talent Soup is a marketplace of models and actors that are booked into mostly Fortune 1000 brand advertising. So uh, it's 13 years old, clients are Delta, Home Depot, Marriott. Bank of America, Chick-fil-A, I mean, lots of brands you know. Um, and they basically shop for talent. So we're more of a brokerage than a talent agency. Um, it's all Rails and SQL, basically. Cool. And uh, it was a tool, it was an internal tool that we built. My wife is a producer, and uh, we had a production company in Atlanta, and we built it for her company. And word got out that we had this tool that made effectively casting, online casting, easier, but it's not really casting. It's really more akin to shopping. And uh, word got out and it, we kind of flipped it from an internal tool, we flipped it over to a public facing page um, and was quite literally profitable instantly. Wow. So, because it was already built out, it had already proven its value. Um, the dilemma of chicken or egg in the marketplace was wasn't an issue because it was really an inventory, it was kind of an inventory management tool on the inside um, because it was a client of one. You know, it was right. my, my wife's production company or her clients. 
And so um, her peer producers were looking for opportunities to find more talent and it made it really easy. And uh, so we, we flipped it over and, and other producers in Atlanta started using it. And uh, there was a job for Aflac, no, I'm sorry, Aflac, yeah, Columbus, Georgia. I think they're yeah, based out of Columbus. Yeah, out of Columbus. And uh, there was a project for Aflac that one of the producers was using, uh, was not using Talent Soup for. And come to find out that uh, there was a lot of collusion among the brick and mortar agencies. And that's kind of typical, uh, unfortunately, in that space. And they had kind of put their heads together and decided for this particular Aflac project, the price for the talent would be, you know, X, whatever it was. And the sum of the talent costs exceeded the total production budget. Wow. And so the producer called uh, Emily in a bind, my wife Emily, and said, what do I do? And she said, oh, well, I have this tool. You can have access and see if you can fulfill the talent side of the production. And, uh, and she did. And everybody won. It was great. You know, we, uh, we made a happy client. And it was later we found out that the brick and mortar agencies were threatened by Talent Soup, and we right. had not thought anything of using this tool. And so when I dug into why they were threatened and started to kind of peel back the layers of this business, it's classic technological disintermediation. That's all it is. There's, right. you know, there's the the marketplace there's kind of a supply and demand there's an inter intermediary that's controlling access to each other and we were kind of ignorantly trying to just make that more efficient and uh accidentally stumbled into a business model really it's not we're not that smart okay so what's the revenue model uh it's 92 percent uh brokerage model so it's uh, kind of cost plus we add a brokerage fee on top we also take a percentage of a booking. So a, a scenario would be, uh, you know, a client, a brand comes to us, they're putting a campaign together for, uh, right now where they're shooting summer stuff, basically summer advertising. So they put a, a project together, they book a bunch of talent, they pay the talent $2,000 for usage and they spend four or five hours on set. Um, we bill them 20% on top for the talent and then we take a 20% from the talent themselves, so we kind of double dip. The difference is we actually, with a very small monthly subscription, uh, we allow the talent to keep that 20% because they have skin in the game. Mm -hmm. So okay. they can, and that's, it's a really small percentage of revenue, but we built it because we felt like that's the right thing to do. Right. You know, it's kind of the golden rule. If you, if you look at the model that the traditional brick and mortar uh, talent agencies use and have used, it, um, it can be exploitive. Not everybody. I mean, there are great agencies out there, so don't don't hear me painting a broad brush. But we thought our costs are low. The carry costs are low for right. a transaction. So why not give folks that are part of Talent Soup and have skin in the game with a monthly subscription, give them an opportunity to win when we put them to work, when we book them. And uh, but it's a it's a you know it's not a subscription model right. for us. It's mostly the brokerage model. So give us a feel for how big this is. Like how many talent, how many sure. people, yeah, headshots so, and bios oh do you man, have in this uh, Millions of images. Wow. Um, 27 or 8,000 talent total. And they're all uh, over. Yeah, they're concentrated in the southeast. Okay. I mean, we play pretty heavily in Atlanta, uh, Miami, Dallas. I mean, mostly the southeast. My, Atlanta is probably 75% of revenue, I think. Um, anywhere there are Fortune 500, Fortune 1000 headquarters, typically ad agencies set up a shop mm -hmm. nearby, and uh, the constraints of the advertising budgets now, they don't travel much anymore, so they shoot okay. close by. So that's kind of where we, where we end up. Um, but we've, we've sent talent to the Caribbean, to Mexico, to Canada. You know, it's, it, it could be much larger, but then international law Right. As an expense that we don't really want to tackle right now. So. And so then how many projects do you like run in a year? Like how um, many scouts or? Yeah, no, I mean bookings. Bookings. It's 
hundreds and hundreds of 1099s. I don't know. I mean, it's... Wow. Yeah. We, what a pain. <laughs> it's, uh, well, I, I will say... January 31st must have been really fun for you well, guys. It's, <laughs> recently, it's automated. Um, recently, in the last four or five years, a yeah. lot of the tools have come along to make the digital process yeah. way easier. But I can tell you, I have mm. bought out Office Depot forms that you can run through your laser printer before yeah. and bought everything in the display, you know, to run all the 1099s and the 1096 and wow. yeah that's so anyway fun. That's it's fun. great no that's it's a great fun. model that's people um, people in this business are the talent are amazing and I'm, um, I'm more analytical and left brain and really didn't appreciate how hard creatives behind the camera and in front of the camera work and that there's actually a lot of art and skill to it and um, and I'll never forget I was visiting a production that my wife was running, and uh, I'd showed up for craft service. To be honest, they were they had a <laughs> they had a caterer Relax, that was an amazing you. caterer in Atlanta, and uh, Rooster Cookies go. Oh yeah! And uh, I had shown up showed up to uh, to enjoy lunch and just you know check in on the production, and uh, a model showed up, and she didn't. I mean, she you know she was an attractive person, of course, but. She went through hair and makeup and was a different person that I saw that walked in and she stepped onto the psych wall, you know, the, the sort of seamless wall in the background that, that gives you a nice background. She stepped on it and took on a character and it was watching magic happen. And I, it, I, mean, I was affected by it. It was yeah. genuinely an astonishing change. And I've always had a great deal of respect for talent ever since then because it's, it's a challenging role you know and it's not I couldn't do it I'm not that I don't have any creativity in me like that so yeah Very it's a cool. fun it's a fun business Very cool. great fun. people it's really really good people so, so t give us a feel like how big you're today your how big's your team how yep so uh, everybody except myself and our CTO are contractors mm -hmm. and um, based on this legislation that's coming mm -hmm. for the gig economy um, we're looking, we're talking to our insurance folks about what workers' comp for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people looks like. And oh, uh, wow. it's, I hadn't thought about that. it's really challenging. I can, I'm almost an expert and might even turn it into an, to a PEO for talent. That's kind of where okay. I think I would have to end up if, if this, uh, this employment legislation passes. Uh, everybody else is contractors. It's, um, it, it's a function of scaling up quickly and then scaling back down again because we can't we can't carry labor because the the project well we could but the project flow is very intermittent right. and it follows some general trends we have three dead spots in the year that have proven really consistent um, election years are terrible as a rule interesting so the media buy for the media buy usually is taken up with election stuff like election purchases. And so they don't produce a lot. Uh, they don't produce a lot of new content. The advertisers, they tend to recycle a lot of things or they'll hit the stock catalogs more heavy. Um, I mean, that's sample size of one, but that seems to be pretty consistent, so. I'm, this is off the cuff, hadn't even thought of this, but how has like the streaming revolution impacted the business? You know, Netflix, all these things now, yeah. you know, commercial a, free, is that it's a really great question. impacting the business? Um, or? Well, so, the influencer model showed mm -hmm. up first. Right. I think the, the idea of influencers, which has been proven um, less valuable than I think advertisers thought. Right. They threw a lot of money at influencers and kind of, and so if, if, you, if you don't know, if you have a l big social media following, um, the idea was you could kind of, kind of subtly, passively advertise on our behalf. So if we were Marriott or, I mean, I don't, I'm going to make all this up. We were some big hotel chain, and we found some influencers that traveled a lot. We would give them a trip, and they'd stay at the Marriott and say good things about you know the hotel they were in, in exchange for a free trip or some level of compensation. Um, and it's proven harder to track from a right. from a return on investment. So um, the funny thing about the digital revolution in advertising that most talent don't appreciate is their shelf life, the imagery shelf life is, I mean, it's a 
uh, several factors less than it used to be. Because when print media dominated advertising and billboards and bus wraps and kind of traditional photo, or you had a media buy on a major network on television, um, and even when cable came along and you had a really consistent exposure rate, the, the cost to compensate the talent was spread out over the timeline because media was more expensive. You were buying these placements and it would stay in market longer. And with the advent of digital, a, a campaign might be a two or three day exposure. I mean, it, it, it's astonishing. So the costs, from our perspective, the costs really collapsed um, in the market. Motorcycle rider motorcycle out front there, yeah. Woo-hoo. See, we were in the city First of Savannah. Time, Come on. Um, but it was, yeah, it's interesting. The talent didn't really adjust to the yeah. fact that what was a four or five thousand dollar project for them, their net was four or five grand, is now fifteen hundred dollars, two thousand wow. dollars. So it was pretty pretty dramatic. That's hard. But yeah. the volume went up. So that's the that's the trade off. Yeah, and I guess the other thing that I was thinking about was the like the Peloton commercial, right? Mm-hmm. With the backlash and then like within 24 hours Ryan Reynolds had got a new That's right. commercial out reacting to that That's right. and how fast that has to happen. Yes, it's um, it's amazing. And how fast things like that like cuz you're creating content not just for television anymore, you're creating it for every screen. For everywhere. That's yeah. that's exactly right. That's I think um, so we're Talent Soup's in a project right now that's a, an extension of a of a pilot that we booked talent for a little while ago, and um, the conversation with the client. So I'm I'm speaking to the executives in the marketing of this national company, and it's it's interesting. Their approach is much more um, experimental, so they're willing to kind of roll the dice on a, on a few different things and if they can keep the production costs low and the talent costs, I mean, the talent costs what they cost and you know, you gotta rent equipment and grip and locations and all that, you know, there's some, there's some established costs that don't really change, but, if, but they're, they're recognizing, let's produce a lot of content that carries our message and um, is positioned well, but we can distribute it in a lot of different places and just test what works and what messages work. Um, and so it's really, it's really exciting to watch it's because it's a, uh, it feels more organic. So you get these massive corporate brands with established processes and cultures that would be rigid under normal circumstances. And the changing market is demanding their, their speed and demanding creativity in ways that I don't think anybody could have imagined. So it's pretty cool. That is cool. I mean, it's a little bit like startup life, right? You have to be able to weave and That's go, it. and you know, even with my job at CETA, Savannah Economic Development Authority, which is a fairly old school, rigid organization. Like this year, I got a certain amount of money built into the budget for actual experiments. I said, right. I need money that I can just play with. Like yeah. I need to be able to say, oh, this is going on. I want to put ten thousand dollars there and see if it can activate entrepreneurial activity. Like, what, like what's new? Yeah. What's new for CETA? What are you What are you doing? SCAD well, is a big one. Yeah. So my, you know, the relationship with SCAD is very important, and this year we approached the SCAD uh, relationship extremely differently, right? So I went out and and have built relationships, and and the the number one thing we're doing is we are the platinum sponsor of SCAD Startup Week, which actually happens to be going on right now. We have 301 SCAD students that all came together last Friday, formed 48 teams, and are all working on ideas for a company based on the idea of uh, a theme, which is giving a voice. Hmm. And so I spent uh, most of the day Friday with them. I spent uh, about four or five hours with them on Tuesday. A, a team came over here for an interview today, and all of them are looking to, uh, uh, some are giving a voice to people that are deaf in you know public areas where they might not be able to hear warning signs or notifications, domestic violence, uh, immigrants, uh, orphans or, or young kids mm-hmm. um, in foster care. And, and they're all working on these different ideas. And, and tomorrow is the finale uh, at the SCAD 
Museum of Art, so I'm really excited I get to judge that. Um, and the idea hopefully is, you know, out of those 48 teams, maybe 13 will continue to next quarter. And maybe after that, three might make it to the summer, and maybe those three will actually do something meaningful. And, and next year it could be 400 students. Yeah, and, and so, 70 yeah, teams so, and so, you know, yeah. that's one of them, right? The, the, the experiment that we're doing right now is called Future Health. So, um, it's really kind of um, interesting. We got together United Healthcare, Optum, Data Group, and, and uh, two startups, the Georgia Nurses Association and Navicent out of Macon. And the theme that we went after was how can you use technology, Internet of Things, mm. AR, VR, phones, whatever, to assist in either elder care or rural care. Hmm. And we have 18 students working on that. Midterm was last week. Uh, at the end, we'll, we will see actual prototypes of, of software that will do meaningful things for this, these audiences in, a, in about four more weeks. Um, the interesting thing about this is, is that the IP is open. So hmm. the SCAD students could decide to move forward and form a company out of it and, and not Oh, the, the IP is not owned by any of the companies that are partners, and it's not really owned by SCAD. So, so real startup activity could happen, and the and the companies might fund it. So um, that's the experiment one, mm. um, and then career fair, yeah. right? So the big one, the other big one is the career fair. So I've got a we've rented a, a double booth at the career fair next Friday, and we've got six startups that are going to actually work the booth, and kind of the message is, you know you can stay in the creative coast and have a cool job working for one of these cool startups. And it's only gonna get better because we're working to grow more and more startups every day. Totally. I would, I would also offer that CETA's seems to be softening because they hired the right person <laughs> for the job, <laughs> which is an anomaly for them historically. So, yes. Yeah. So everybody watching and listening, yeah. get involved in the creative coast and go participate. Because yeah. we have a community to build, and yeah. she can't do it up by herself. Yeah, it takes community, right? That's right. Um, it's it's uh, you know my my job is to come up with interesting ideas and try and just get the right people in the room. And uh, my you know we we talk about what we're testing out a new tagline. It's the Creative Coast, where creatives, technologists, and entrepreneurs uh, create, code, and collide. We're that place, right? And the idea is you get a graphic designer, uh, some coders, and an entrepreneur in a room, and maybe magic happens. Maybe a company is built from that. In five to 10 years, we have a 300-person company down the road, right? That's the, so the more we do to bring people together with beer and wine uh, and snacks is, is, is good. But back to you. Okay. All right, so um, you talked a little about like this was your own homegrown solution, so mm -hmm. you didn't have to go find a first customer. You well, had it was, a yeah, you, I mean, were the, you were it the was first an, customer. It was a scratch room niche yeah. solution, basically. Yeah. So we were the first customer. You were the first customer. Yes. Who was your f second customer? Uh, the producer that ran the Affleck job. Okay. That was the first external project. Yeah. They booked 114 talent wow. That's for a big. week shoot yeah, at Affleck. That's it a lot of people. It's a lot of people. Yeah. Because yep. you and I both know it's so hard to get that ever important first customer. It is. Um, so outside funding. Yep. Did you take any? Nothing. Bootstrapped oh, and debt-free and profit profitable ever since. Well, it, it's it's a good question because I'm struggling with, my kids are a little older now, the demands of children are less. Um, I'm contemplating, uh, I, don't, see, I, don't know, I don't know if <laughs> <laughs> outside capital is the right uh, approach for an, uh, an older company, so I'm contemplating what to do with it uh, in what I think it should be, knowing what I know now. And it's, uh, it's a lateral expansion of services in the same space, basically. So it's, right. um, uh, the talent suit thing is kind of tongue in cheek, obviously, um, but it's an ingredient in a production. I mean, a production is a lot like cooking. You're assembling a lot of ingredients, applying some processes, and you get a great outcome. That's the goal in, in imagery. And so we um, we kind of played on that yeah. talent soup thing. And there are other ingredients that we would handle well. We have before as experiments. And so, uh, but haven't taken funding. Um, my early venture-backed 
experiment kind of, I won't say it burned me on it, but I saw really clearly where it fit and we were not running that hard. Like we were not, because it's, it's a substantial commitment to your shareholders yep. and we wouldn't take that lightly. So we, we opted to kind of kind of bootstrap along and it's it was a lifestyle business, is a lifestyle business with a lot of potential and um, now I'm at a, at a spot where I think it's time to realize that potential, so. It seems that you could grow beyond the region as well, right? Chicago has an advertising, is an advertising sure. hub, certainly LA yeah. and the West Coast has opportunity there. And so that, that would probably take some additional capital to. Yeah, so. I, I mean, I you need some feet in the street to build the relationships, right? I, I watched the Uber expansion really yeah. carefully. Um, and, and what I found fascinating about yeah. it, they would, they would only move into highly regulated markets once they had enough cash to afford the attorneys. Right. And, um, and I'm, you know, I'm winging it when I kind of simp simplify it that way, but, uh, but the, the New York state and California markets are hostile to our model and the demands are very high and regulatory demands and costs. So we would, yeah. we'd have to be guerrilla style if we were headed in that direction. Interesting. Yeah. I hadn't really thought of you as Uber for talent, but certain it's type of talent. But yeah, yeah. I mean, well, well, I mean, we're, we're, I mean, at uh, least with the 1099 model, you kind of well, are. So, well, you know, our, of the 20,000 talent, 13,000 of them are represented, mm -hmm. which means their agencies have built agency accounts inside our system and then signed all their talent up. Right. Right. So when we, uh, that means the rest of them are independent contractors. When we book a talent that's an independent, we pay them directly. That's a 1099 report. Uh, when we book agency talent, we pay the agency and the agency pays them. So right. we're, uh, we're passing that through. They still need 1099s. They, they still get a 1099, <laughs> of course, but, but it, it's, a, it's a model that adopts yeah. easily. And the brick and mortar agencies, especially the smaller agencies, because it's highly competitive, they see us as a, as a marketing expense and maybe a, a competitor to some extent. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I've realized that a few times in conversation. But on the whole, they right. we give them exposure to projects that they would never get calls for. So it, it yeah. works really well. Interesting. Yeah. Um, you kind of already answered that question. So what has been your biggest challenge in growing Talent Soup? Hmm. Uh, my co-founder is a genius CTO up in New York. And... The biggest challenge is has probably been the discipline to to iterate or develop a new uh, a new part of the service with the greatest potential for return and not just chase really interesting things. Mm. That's that's been that's been really challenging. Um, yeah, that that's about it. I r resisting the uh, the potential upside and chasing after it and really I mean it strangely I think people start lifestyle businesses because it fits the lifestyle and it you know it generates the amount of income that they're interested in investing time in mm -hmm. for and uh, I'm sure everybody sees the the potential for growth and scale but there's a kind of the a type driver in me that hears that whisper a lot and thinks, man, I'm not a good steward of this, what could be. What could be. You know? Yeah. So, yeah, that's a little weird bearing in my soul. I really wasn't planning sorry, on sorry. talking about that. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't mean to okay. take it there. No. Um, no, I think it's, it's interesting because, yeah, I mean, as a r former chief technology officer, sometimes I wanted to build something just to prove that I could build it, right. <laughs> whether or not the money was there. Right? Right. I was like, oh, that sounds really cool. Because it would be fun. Yeah. I, is it possible? Right. It's got to be possible. How is it That's possible? Right. Let me work on it. Where's right? the Mountain Dew? Right? Yeah. And, and go. So, yeah. So, I've, I've been there. Mm. Been there myself. Very late nights. Mm -hmm. um, you've mentioned and used the word lifestyle business quite a bit. Um, 
you make it sound like it's easy to build a lifestyle business. <laughs> I, I wish it's I not. had a lifestyle business yeah. <laughs> that was easy. I don't know of anybody that's built an easy one. So I mean, mm. I think um, I think there's a lot of people that that actually seek what you have, mm -hmm. right? Um, I don't know. If there's a question there. I think the fact that your wife was an expert in this and you built it to scratch your own itch, so to speak, made the transition easier, Definitely. probably, right? Definitely. Than, than going out and saying, hey, I want to build a lifestyle business. What kind of lifestyle business am I going to build, right? right? Um, well, so in conversation with entrepreneurs yeah. and, and folks with a desire to be, uh, a theme I've noticed is that they don't really know what lifestyle they want. So, um, I mean, you, you, I think you, you build toward something, whether you know it or not, whether you're intentional about it or not, you're building toward something. And if you haven't defined what that thing is, then it, it just adds one more variable of potential uh, failure because you haven't really established what a win looks like for you. Yep. And so, um, we, uh, her production company, we, we sold the book of business and dissolved it in 2012 because um, she took over uh, educating the kids. And so up until that point, you know, we were a dual income, running hard family. And uh, it, I think that gave Talent Soup the cover to, to grow enough eventually to sustain the the household mm -hmm. so it was a I mean it's a privileged position no doubt but um, but time is a is the most precious commodity we have and so mm -hmm. um, yeah so I think I've just maybe in my gray hair gotten better at discerning where I'm investing that and what it looks like and um, really defining the lifestyle and then kind of reverse engineer what we're trying to what we're trying to live as and how and work backwards and make sure that those things are aligned. Right. Yeah. So you run our ATDC Lean Startup Circle. I'm lucky to do so. Yes. Right. Uh, the last Monday of the month. Yeah. And that that whole you embraced Lean Startup and mm -hmm. the customer development journey uh, as developed by Steve Blank. Yep. Um, gosh. A decade ago, ago yeah. I don't know, right? Yeah. So before, before, I, before the book, before yeah. I ever heard about it from anybody else, you were running this at the Creative Coast. Yeah. How do how do you find that path? Yeah. So uh, Eric Farkas, my co-founder, is um, uh, the architect of everything, and so he, through, I don't know, Hacker News and yeah. Thirty Seven Signals and kind of all the all the industry information and people he was following and introducing, he. Uh, he introduced the lean, well, really the agile model on agile software, model. yeah, on software side, and and lean tendencies to have borrowed the right reactionary forces from an agile model versus a waterfall model of product right. development, which is what I was trained in, um, and so it's it's weirdly logical. I mean, mm -hmm. it's 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 a very um, biological model where the the environmental pressures on the business should dictate the actions to realize the outcome that you're that you're working on and not some sort of artificial I know how to build it and if I just build this perfect thing you know right. well w w we fool ourselves better than anybody so um, so when we were following the Y Combinator growth and as they sort of opened the the doors and let more people in on how they ran uh, their their incubator the again, just the logic of it was being proven again and again in their success rates. And I think we would be foolish to not follow it. Because it's, really to your point, it's so hard to tell an entrepreneur that just knows this <laughs> is a million dollar opportunity that they're probably fooling themselves statistically. Right. It's hard to get them to snap out of that and realize it's not a formula and that the market will tell you, if you ask the right questions and you listen carefully, the market will tell you what it needs and there might be a good, solid business in there. So, yeah. Chances are not, but yeah. Statistically, <laughs> it's Statistically like speaking, no. a restaurant. That's right. <laughs> um, so what does success look like for you? Oh, 
I've, I've it's like an interview that, question, isn't it? Oh, you I know? have a premise that like everyone's view biggest, of success is different, right? So we all have failure, different aspirations. Your biggest weakness. Um, I'm not going to ask your weakness. Thank you. I, 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 lots of them on display. Uh, success looks like for me, I think enjoying the people that I spend the most time with. Um, everybody with a bed to sleep in and full bellies, that would be successful, yeah. right? Really simple things. Um, and, and feeling uh, feeling good about investing time and energy into people and community okay. and recognizing more than ever, I would say, I've moved around a lot and um, more than ever, the, the contrast of the connectivity of our world, exposing how completely disconnected we really are, um, and, it, and that, I think, being a crutch for a natural tendency to kind of isolate ourselves, that I, wanna, I want to be found on my deathbed um, at least having contributed to connecting more people and serving neighbors and, you know, just building community. Because, I mean, people are eternal, mm -hmm. right? The rest of this stuff is going to end up, I mean, whoever said everything you own is going to end up in a dump. That, you know, it's true. So, yeah. there you go. Wow. Wow, deep wow. thoughts. There you go. Okay. <laughs> so glad I bought that second house. No. Yeah, really, exactly. <laughs> uh, so, um, <laughs> Any, so we've got a lot of entrepreneurs yeah. or would-be entrepreneurs watching us, tips, tricks, encouragement. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'm a contrarian naturally and um, your, whatever the Tesla quote or Edison or whoever said it's 99% perspiration and 1% inspiration, mm -hmm. it's probably uh, a tenth of inspiration and 99.9% perspiration. Um, consistency wins, listening, being a good listener. Don't ask your mom if you have a good idea or your dad or your family, you know, anybody in your family, because they're going to tell you it's, they're not going to probably tell you what you need to hear. They're going to tell you what you want to hear. Um, but be ready to take some punches and commit yourself to always getting back up again. And you, most entrepreneurs that I've read or talked to, and, and my experience bears this to be, uh, to be true as well, what you start pursuing is not likely to be what you end up finding success in. Right. So, they, so the goal is just keep showing up and keep, stay on the path and keep moving forward and, um, and just, it's, it's a rough saying, but embrace the suck. I mean, it's, it's hard, it's a difficult, road and um, no is the answer you will hear exponentially more than yes. But that's what separates the people that plow through it, you know, the hustlers. So. Yeah. I always like to tell people too, I think of it as a series of sprints, not a marathon. Totally. Because if you treat it like a marathon, you're going to burn out. Totally true. But if you sprint, take a little pause, sprint, yeah. take a little pause, sprint, take a little pause. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Run in the right direction based yeah. on the information you have, right? Yeah. So it's sort of Occam's razor on a moment by moment basis. I use the uh, Everest. Yeah. You gotta have base camps. So you yeah. so you work really hard, you know, you surround yourself with the right people. We should all have a Sherpa. Those people are amazing. Um, <laughs> and you get to a point where you can sort of take a breath and acclimate and look around you and figure out what you have. And then you take a smaller version of what you brought with you, but it's the right version for the next leg of the journey. And, you know, rinse and repeat until you get to the top. So, yeah. same idea. Yep. That's a good one. So, do you think we have a, a minute or two if we have any audience questions? Mark's, <laughs> Mark's been writing, so I was figuring oh he had one. <laughs> Brad, in a marketplace, we all are aware that trust is integral to the mechanism working. How do you build trust in the talent soup marketplace? Do you have ratings and reviews? Mark, that is a fantastic question. Um, so the a, a common euphemism I use is about about cor co corporate culture. Is that if you're not intentional, you'll have one. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, the culture of Talent Soup is, I hope, conveyed in the language we use on the website. I'm going to come back to your question about ratings and that sort of thing. But the language we use, it's, it's how we positioned Talent Soup. And kind of, you know, back to your success thing, I, I sleep really well at night because I want to I, I want to treat people the way I want to be treated and that allows me if we've you know made a mistake and it's a big hit financially we just take the hit I mean we I, yes so I think trust is built in the minutia and it's in the language we use and it's a reflection of us I mean it's you know my co-founder and my wife my wife owns talent soup and contributes as well so I, I think it starts with those, uh, the tone of the brand and the tone, and uh, and fortunately, in the in the talent business, the norm is uh, kind of exploitation, and I don't, I don't mean in the really dark sense of the word exploitation. It take it the system takes advantage of the number of people that want to be in the business. So talent are a commodity for the most part, and. Um, you know, LA is well known for taking advantage of people that just want to be in a movie. And so we try to run a business that keeps all the lights on and is really transparent. I mean, we, uh, we don't withhold information from either side. We don't, um, we connect them with contact information as much, or they, as much as they want. You know, if the client wants to have a direct connection to the talent after they're booked, we don't need to be in the middle of that. Um, those kinds of things. Um, today, uh, there was a misunderstanding on set, so a production was going on, the talent, the, the director of photography called me and said, one of the talent is not clear on the usage that we booked them for, I've got a crew in a house that I've rented, you know, I mean, like, it's a full production. And so we got on the phone with the talent and with the DP, and I said, how do we ask the talent, how, do you, how can we remedy this? And he said, well, you've always treated me well. This is what I think you know is the market rate, and I didn't understand it was this for the usage, etc. I know I'm being a little cryptic, but um, and so we just made it right, and everybody was happy. And I apologized to the DP because it put them in a strange spot to be on set with a disgruntled talent. Um, and I apologized to the talent for not clarifying that and making sure he understood what was going on, you know. But he was he maintained professionalism, and we tried to maintain professionalism and. And I think that's worked out best. So uh, I don't spend a lot of time on ratings and where, I mean, we have a five star on Google and people write nice things about us on Facebook. And for the people that don't write, write nice things, I try to yes. respond appropriately, but uh, we don't try to please everybody because there are just some really grumpy people. So it, it, is, it is what it is. You know, we, we try to look ahead for the most part and not, you know, not worry about that too much, but. I have a follow-on question to that. Uh, how do you avoid uh, disintermediation? That is, actors going around your marketplace or producers. Uh, uh, totally. Contacting the, uh, the actors. Totally. Uh, so the, yeah, uh, oh, there's more. Pardon the pun, have you kicked off any bad actors? <laughs> uh, <laughs> we, we have recommended some <laughs> bad actors. Nice. Uh, we have recommended that we <laughs> probably are not a good fit for them. Not many. Um, so in the thousands of thousands and thousands of talent we've booked over 13 years, we've had four challenging issues, right? Um, which statistically is really good. Um, so what was the first part of the question? I was ready to respond to that. I'm this sorry. Intermediation. That yeah. How, okay. Well, see, so you can't. Yeah, so the, the, the challenge of a marketplace is um, you become the very thing that you blew up, right? And, and the walled garden um, technology doesn't, doesn't like that because it creates market opportunities for competitors to show up and build the right thing. And so again, uh, we want to convey trust and transparency and that your loyalty should be Founded in the value we provide and the trust that we offer, really, um, they do. They do. Talent do go around it, but I'm operating on economies of scale, not on the one-off, yes. right? So a, a brick and a small brick-and-mortar agency might have 150, 200 talent. We have 
20 plus, I don't even know how many now. I mean, it's, I don't look at that anymore. You know, almost 30,000 talent. Yes. So um, I'm really not worried about it, quite frankly. Um, and I, and I, I, I would caution anybody in a marketplace or with a marketplace thinking hard about how to prevent normal human behavior and think about your value. Like what, are, what value are you offering? And if it's not attractive enough to keep them in the system, well, that, I mean, that's why we offer talent the ability to make that 20% back, which nobody does in our business, by the way. Nobody offers talent more money. They all take a, you know, they all double dip. And the model's built on it. So it was an opportunity for us to say, well, we don't, we don't have to do it that way, so we're not going to do it that way, you know? Yeah. Excellent. That's a good question. That's a great question. I have one last question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Since I am uh, building a marketplace myself, you gave the example of Uber. When Uber starts in a new city, they have to have enough drivers prior to activating the rider application. And once they've activated both of them, in a two-sided marketplace, ideally it's a network effect, which is essentially ratcheting two markets simultaneously. Sure. You, you, how did you prime your marketplace? You primed it first with a lot of talent. Mm -hmm. And if I'm a, an actor, I go to the website, I want to make sure there are enough projects then that producers are putting into the marketplace mm -hmm. that I can apply for. Sure. How did you prime those markets initially? Yeah, so clarification, you can't submit yourself in our system. That's the difference. You, if you're talent in our system, you are inventory effectively, and clients come in and shop for inventory, right? It's, 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 it's very passive. Your only requirement is to maintain, create a valuable, marketable account, a portfolio, mm -hmm. and keep it current. And then the system uses all of your information to match the search queries of the, of the production, basically. Okay, so um, I think it would be important to, to consider carefully uh, large existing entity marketplaces as examples and draw conclusions from them because they can afford to wait on tipping points before they invest in new markets. Right? They have brand recognition, they have a ton of money to spend on marketing and penetration on either side of the coin. And so for, for a startup, for somebody starting out, um, the simplest way to test a hypothesis of the value of a new marketplace is to do it in analog, is to go basically into meat space and you know, if you want to start an online you know, widget company, then figure out how you can test some assumptions and talk to potential customers in person, buy a box of widgets and go hit the corner and start selling them and find out. Um, there's, a, there's so many lessons that I think you skip over if you think that technology actually is the value. Ultimately, for most companies, Technology is the infrastructure that allows value to be realized, right? It's that exchange component. Um, it's software as a service. It's efficiencies, economies of scale. It's all those things that are enabled by technology. But ultimately, the value, unless you're selling the IP, you know, unless you're acquired, that's a different conversation. But in a, in a, uh, in a traditional revenue generating business, uh, the goal for you is you need to build inventory and you need to build clients, right? So start out manually and learn there and the there's so many lessons you learn you learn language and you learn tone um, it feeds your marketing information it feeds how you build your brand and your positioning um, that's how Zappos did it. yeah that's I mean Tony yeah, they did the analog. Tony was like buying shoes and you know people started out buying stuff out of overstock uh, Uber is interesting because it is so ubiquitous but it's also not profitable so that's that's a great point <laughs> <laughs> that's, exa that's exactly right. By billions of dollars. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Has anybody uh, tried to copy your model? 
You know, there, yeah, competition out there now that totally, yeah, there, there, there have existed since the dawn of the internet um, pseudo competitors, and I say pseudo. So Craigslist, uh, you know, people were finding talent on Craigslist, and then it, and then it kind of went non-mainstream. And I'll, you can explore that if you want. <laughs> um, so none of our clients go outside and go into sort of non, go into. De, those traditional channels because if you have a six or seven figure production of two or three days and lots of moving parts, you don't risk it on finding talent that you can't, that are unprofessional, right? Someone hasn't actually tried to be a direct competitor to you in that space by creating... Yeah, n well, there's, uh, there's two. One is uh, New Zealand-based and um, they have a slightly different model. They're almost all subscription models, so they're almost all uh, loading the revenue model onto the backs of the talent. So you pay to belong to their, and see for us, you can belong for free and we just take 20% if we can put you to work. So, so the barrier to participation for the talent is all, all pretty much zero. So they, they, they don't even really need to qualify how many projects we have that they think they would fit. And, and also more than half of our projects don't get announced publicly because we operate under a lot of confidentiality. And so you know, the things we announce are just kind of tip of the iceberg typically. So, I don't know if I answered the question in a roundabout sort of way. Yeah, cool. But, yeah. I have one. Sure. All right. Uh, maybe we'll show out about. So, you have three kids? Yeah. What are you going to teach your children about entrepreneurship? And already started. Yeah, we've already started it. Um, we spend a lot of time uh, thinking through and talking about uh, where we spend our money and our time. And as a family, we're pretty transparent about how that works. Um, and uh, understanding the value of work. That's a big one. So my, my children, they, we don't do allowances. We, you, you, know, you're, you are participating in the family and the family feeds you and clothes you and protects you and all of those good things. Um, and hear that mechanically. Don't hear the coldness of that, right? Um, but we don't, um, we try not to limit their spending habits. We, you know, we, and what I mean by that is, they got a five dollar bill from you know for Christmas. Um, if they're dead set on running to the dollar store and buying five worthless things, that seems to happen two or three times until they realize, wow, that thing broke before I got out of the car on the way home. Right? I mean, that's and so uh, it's those little lessons. I mean, I think it's that drip effect of trying to teach them, like we, we live pretty simply and pretty lean ourselves intentionally. And so um, I'm hoping that the do as I say and as I do kind of wears off, you know. But I would love for my children, uh, I don't know what higher education is gonna look like right now. I mean, they're on Khan Academy doing math. I've forgotten. Mark would know all the math, of course. But um, so I, I don't know what it's gonna look like, but if they, have any sort of motivation to build the business that would feed their lifestyle, I'm gonna support that. I'm gonna set them up and I would rather give them, you know, a $5,000, $10,000, $50,000 head start on building a company or two or four or five than sink that time and money into, you know, higher education in its current form. But it depends on the kid, right? I mean, it just depends on the child and their propensity because everybody's built different so yeah yeah all right any final thoughts parting shot uh if you were listening to this and you were not involved in creative coast or entrepreneur night <laughs> or Thanks. um turn this into if commercial. you're not serving in some kind of community even if it means you are supporting a friend that's trying to build a business i don't know i don't know what that looks like for you but um my participation in Creative Coast, and uh, and I have a long history serving in Creative Coast, and took a break, and then now I'm back, and then with ATDC, trying to move uh, you know more resources into Savannah. ATDC brings a ton of value to our city. Uh, you got to get plugged in, and you got to commit to Savannah because I don't want my kids to leave. I want to invest in our city. It's an amazing town. It is unique in the world. Um, Scad here. 
Jen's here, Sita's here, Criticos is here, y'all are here. We don't have excuses to not build great things. And if we do, then my kids stay here and continue to plant roots. So that's the goal. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. That's it for tonight's uh, Entrepreneur Night. I oh, do want to do a shout out to anybody that's listening. We are going to have a Leap Year party to show off our new space. So Leap Year Social on February 27th, uh, 4.30 to whenever, right here at 2 East Bryan, uh, Suite 100 Day. Hope to see you there. See you on the flip side.